Good afternoon and welcome to Poison Pen. We, today we have an interview with uh, slightly, again, slightly different from our normal take here at the, at the pen. Uh, we have Mr. Philip Bonds, an educator, an underwater photographer, and a resource management park ranger for the National Park Service, and who's also a photographer who's colorblind. And we'll get into that. We'll get into that later. The book is Dancing with Sea Lions, Adventures with California Sea Lions. It's a wonderful book, but much more than a coffee table book. The pictures in it are fantastic. Um, but it's also about education, conservation, mutual respect for these incredible animals and these creatures. So Bill's been doing this for a long time, and he's just full of knowledge about sea lions and, and the ocean in general. Um, one of the things I'd like to ask right off the bat is, it, I address it in the book, most people think anything laying on the rocks by the ocean is a, is a sea lion or um, a seal, and I guess most, most seals. It, can you expound a little on the difference between a sea lion and a seal? Yeah, the, one of the first things I do in the book is talk about the differences because there's so much confusion with these two animals. They belong to kind of the same uh, taxonomical uh, family. They're what we call pinnipeds. They're fin-footed mammals. And I mean, what some of the main differences, uh, a sea lion, if you actually see a sea lion out someplace, a sea lion actually has an external ear flap. That's the same thing we have. Theirs aren't quite so big and they don't have the same shape, but they've got an external ear flap. Uh, seals uh, have, uh, ears, but they don't have external uh, ear flaps. They've got a hole in their head uh, that, you know, leads into the auditory canal type area and stuff like that so they can hear. But uh, sea lions have that. The other thing is that uh, pinnipeds uh, typically uh, spend time out of the water as well as in the water. Uh, seals are much more uh, designed to stay in the water more than sea lions are. Uh, if you get a seal up on the land, they don't move very well. They kind of inch along on their bellies like inchworms, uh, you know, scooting along on their, on their bellies. A sea lion actually uses its, its fins like legs. All four fins can work like legs. They use their long flippers in the front to, uh, to move around, and their rear flippers actually have the ability to rotate underneath their body and help them with this propulsion stuff on land. Uh, often we're at, when we're at rookeries looking around at the sea lions, uh, we'll see that some of these sea lions have climbed up on top of rocks. They look at like they're perched on different places where you, just looking at it from the ocean, you might wonder, well, how in the heck did that sea lion get up there? Right. Well, that's how they use their, their, their fins. Uh, so those are some differences in uh, typically what people see. Also, sea lions are very social, whereas seals uh, tend to live more of a solitary existence. Very good. Now, di diving, underwater photography involves obviously diving. Um, what are some of the risks? Because these are wild creatures. I mean, you don't hear of attacks, but you do bring it up in the book. These things are a couple hundred pounds moving at 25 miles an hour, <laughs> plus they have teeth, a sharp teeth. Yeah. Uh, a good-sized California sea lion bull weighs uh, upwards of seven, eight hundred. Uh, sometimes, really big ones get to be about a thousand pounds in terms of size. So, bulls are much larger than the females that typically can weigh a couple of hundred pounds. Uh, the main risks you have to, you know, any, with dealing with any type of wild animal, you have to be able to to observe its behavior and, and kind of understand uh, what's going on with it. Uh, I didn't just jump in the water with a camera and start taking pictures of these guys. I actually uh, studied them for a while and paid a lot of attention to not just the sea lions that I was uh, seeing, but I talked to a lot of people who had been diving for years and years and years with them and then kind of got some tips on what behaviors to watch for. Uh, bull sea lions are territorial, particularly in the spring months. They, they do uh, you know, their, their mating and breeding thing uh, starting in the early spring. And a, a bull sea lion doesn't protect females, it protects territory. Uh, so if you are 
encroaching uh, in a bull sea lion's territory. Divers look a lot like sea lions when we're all geared up in that near those near frame wetsuits, stuff like that. So the bulls don't particularly like having you around. And they will tell you when you're getting too close to their territory line, though, a bull sea lion will actually uh, swim and basically draw a line in the water that doesn't want you to cross. If you ignore that warning and then you move a little closer, it may actually bark at you. It will swim the line and growl at you. I mean, they'll let you know if you're encroaching on their space. And uh, if you, of course, if you ignore that, uh, you're either gonna get bit or you're gonna get hit. I've uh, seen people get hit. Uh, I was with the diver some years ago, we ended up with broken ribs from one of these, uh, a large bull that rammed him underwater, uh, went about 25 miles an hour, broke two of his ribs. Sea lion pushed him back out of his territory. So um, it's a, a very, very competitive uh, kind of place that, that happened. Uh, those rookeries around breeding season are very, very competitive. Uh, you know, those sea bull sea lions aren't putting up with a whole lot of encroachment out there. Uh, so, and that typically, that pretty much lasts all through the summer. It, the activity kind of stuff starts to kind of tapering off in August. But we're usually pretty careful uh, not to get too close. Uh, you know, you got a bull protecting territory. And they will bite. If you get bit by one of these things, uh, odds are probably pretty good. You're going to get a nasty infection because they're wild animals. They don't brush their teeth and they, they have a bacteria in their mouth that will actually cause a, an infection that's very resistant to antibiotics. So it's pretty serious if you get chomped on by one of these guys. But we're gonna see some of the pictures later which are really beautiful, but they all are also are very playful with, with divers in the, in, the, in the water. Yeah, particularly the females and young ones. Uh, you know, the usually when I go diving, uh, we tell anybody who's kind of a rookie on a dive boat, or happen to be on a dive boat, that they usually get the speech about, uh, you want to play, all you have to do is some body movement, like uh, do a kind of a loop-de-loop -loop underwater or do a barrel roll underwater while a sea lion is watching, and they'll come in and they'll engage. And they'll basically imitate you, you can imitate them, and, and you kind of do this play thing. Uh, the downside of that is that when you play their, when you tell them that you want to play their games, they play really rough. They are real, real rough when they play. Uh, they don't mind body contact. I've been thumped by these guys, but particularly by females swimming by me. Uh, you know, I carry a very expensive camera rig. I think when my my whole uh, this camera setup that I, I use was new, it cost me over you know twelve thousand dollars, and it's not something you really want to lose. I keep mine secure to me. I've got two nylon straps. So I actually hook it to me, so it can't get away from me. The reason I do that is because I've literally had sea lions. Uh, come up from behind me where, where, I, where I can't see them. You know, when you're wearing a scuba mask, your, your vision is restricted, particularly your peripheral vision on the side. And you have no eyes in the back of your head. They, these guys are very, very adept at coming uh, high speed. They'll swim, cruise by. And my rig usually has these long strobe arms uh, sticking out. They like to grab those strobe arms and try to take off with, with the whole camera outfit. Uh, typically when they grab mine, they get all of me, uh, so they get to drag me through the water a little ways. Usually that doesn't last long, they usually let me lose pretty quick. Uh, but I've been dragged a couple of times by them, just wanting to come in. And again, they're just playing, but anytime you want to play, it's like, hey, you play by their rules, they don't understand anything else. You, these, you mentioned um, their turf, they're not, and there are sea lions all up and down the coast. California around Baja and into the Sea of uh, Cortez and so these they're not migratory well the ones in the Sea of Cortez typically aren't um, if you get into some of the Pacific regions uh, like uh, you'll find them clear up the Pacific coast of uh, the United States clear up to Alaska there is some migration stuff that goes on. For example, here, you know, in Southern California, uh, sea lion rookeries are, are out on the Channel Islands, which are off the coast of California there. And so uh, these guys actually, uh, they would prefer their mating grounds out in the Channel Islands uh, to kind of hang out and do their thing. But 
due to the fact that we've got a lot of issues happening with the ocean right now, uh, their preferred food, northern anchovies and Pacific sardines, are pretty hard to come by out there in off the Channel Islands. And so what they're doing is they're actually, California areas, they're actually coming in closer uh, to the coastline and actually invading some beach communities because there are other sources of food along the California coastline, things like squid and stuff like that. Uh, Scripps Canyon off La Jolla has a, a large population of, uh, of squid. And it's one of the reasons that that particular area of Southern Cali right there around La Jolla uh, seems to have a growing population of these, these uh, critters. They're coming in because they've got to eat and uh, their food is getting really hard to find out there. Speaking of that, their, their population has significantly grown over the last 20, 30 years. It has. Uh, you know, back before the enactment of the uh, Marine Mammal Protection Act, I think that was in, uh, uh, when was that? 72. That was 1972. Uh, prior to that, that, we figured there were, the, the, by the census numbers, there were about 50,000 living from Alaska, clear down the coastline of the United States, uh, down the coast of Baja in Mexico, up around into the Sea of Cortez and then down the coast of Sonora. Uh, when they, we achieved uh, protection for these animals with the Marine Mammal Protection Act, they're in, they actually began to increase in population. Now there are over 340,000 of these guys uh, living in that same area. And a lot of the research I've looked at here, particularly when I was looking at the book, doing the book, uh, a lot of the researchers actually felt like we had probably reached what they call carrying capacity. In other words, we had about as many sea lions as the environment could support. So right now the number is around 340, 350,000 of them. And some of them in California, they migrate north and south. They, they actually migrate out to the, the uh, west, out to the Channel Islands. Uh, you don't see much movement. The ones that are in the Sea of Cortez, uh, the Gulf of California area, pretty much stay there. One rookery I dived there, uh, I've done quite a bit of diving at the second largest rookery in the sea. That's home to about 3,500 sea lions. And those got, those sea lions pretty much stay right there. When you, you get there, I mean, the the whole island is literally covered with sea lions and the, the water around it is filled with them too. And a, a rookery and a haul out are different things? Or is that the same, basically? Yeah, a, a rookery is a place where they actually do uh, breeding and birthing that birthing activities uh, they can also use it as a haul out a haul out is simply a place where uh, a sea lion you know a sea lion might get out of the water for a while that can be that can be in a that can be at a rookery location but it can also just be a rock out in the middle of nowhere and there, so there are lots and lots of uh, you know haul outs where you'll just see these guys kind of hauled up on you know little small beaches and stuff um, I haven't seen a lot of information on it, but I, uh, some of the resources when I started writing the book indicated that the La Jolla area there in Southern Cali was being used as a haul out, that there really wasn't much happening there in terms of uh, uh, female sea lions giving birth and stuff like that. Here a while back, I did see something about, somebody said, well, it started happening because, you know, I saw a, a, a female sea lion give birth to a, a pup there. And, so I don't know, that may be a, another change that kind of goes with the changes in environment that we're dealing with. Is it like other species where the dominant male bull has, I don't want to use the word, like, like a harem, and <laughs> you know, more than you know several females, and then what happens to the younger male? Does he got to go off and find himself you know, some other companion? Well, a bull, a bull does uh, maintain a harem. But it's kind of interesting because when bulls set up their territory, they do not aggressively pursue uh, females to pull into their harem. Basically, uh, female sea lions are free to kind of go do and go come and go as they please and do what they want with whom they please. Uh, a bull will typically establish a territory of about you know, usually the maximum is about three or four weeks because another bull that's bigger and, and in better shape will co actually come in and displace that bull that had the, 
the harem territory is set up. And so there's a lot of that juggling stuff that goes around. And, you know, uh, female sea lions tend to be kind of promiscuous. They'll kind of breed with whoever happens to come along when it, the time comes for that. Uh, they're also interesting in the aspect that uh, after they do the breeding stuff, a lot of times uh, it takes about a month for the egg actually to implant and start growing into a, a, a fetus. So they kind of do this delayed response thing. They've got a, their uh, pregnancy timeline uh, is similar to humans. It's about nine months. So uh, typically we see that kind of stuff happening. And the, the bulls, when they, they're competing for territory, it's a pretty fierce uh, you know, competition. For, and new bulls coming in, uh, you know, the old guys, uh, they kind of get worn out after a while and allows room for new ones to come in. Do they have, besides the shark, do they have natural predators? Well, there's a couple uh, other than the sharks. Uh, typically, white sharks are the ones that we usually note uh, that are feeding on them. Uh, I'm sure there's probably some instances of tiger sharks, particularly in the Gulf of California, that, that do. Uh, orcas are one of the, the predators there. Of course, uh, one of the major predators that they had to face uh, was people, uh, you know, up until the passage of the Marine Mammal Protection Act in 1972, people hunted sea lions. Uh, you know, there's some old timers that would say, well, you know, if you have a good sized sea lion, you can get a couple of gallons of seal oil out of it by boiling it after you, you kill it. And they use, you know, people use human, uh, humans actually used uh, parts of sea lions in Mexico, uh, and I've never seen an example of this, but I've read about it. They use, uh, they used to use sea lion whiskers uh, as ornamental uh, types of things on Mexican wedding dresses. And uh, of course, uh, the other thing that they have that uh, is still in demand is their uh, a male sexual organ. The uh, sea lion penis is actually a piece of bone, and uh, you know that makes them a target of. Uh, people uh, doing poaching stuff on them because that has, you know, those, that, that, those bones have uh, value in, uh, in Asia and uh, traditional, uh, you know, Asian medicine. Medicine, yeah. But you and point out you the imagination of... about what you can cure with one of those. <laughs> <laughs> it's Chinese medicine, yes. But, which is interesting because other sea lions in on the Western Pacific, to the same extent there are in the California Western Coast. Ask me that question again. Are there, are there sea lions on the Asian Pacific uh, rim as there are in the tunnel? Well, know? I know there are there are some there are uh, different species of pinnipeds, like in Australia, places like that. I don't really know of any that you would find up. Uh, you know, in East Asia, up towards uh, Japan, China, those those kinds of areas. No, but if you go down into Australia, you get into uh, sea lions and fur seals pretty quick. Yeah, I I I I've been in the Orient quite a few times, and I always wondered who was the first guy who discovered <laughs> that using the penis from a sea lion was going to cure any, anything. Oh. Well, I don't know that there, there's, you know, none of that stuff is really documented. Right. Uh, the same guys that are ripping uh, gills out of uh, manta rays and right. grinding them up and using them for, right. for you know, yeah. it's just, there's a lot of things that are out there that Unfortunately. are kind of, in my view, kind of goofy. Yeah. But one, of, one of the things you mentioned in the book um, is sea lions actually, with the big whites, especially when they go for them, can actually pr pretty much avoid them, out out maneuver them, out swim them, and um, so they're not particularly afraid of, of of sharks. No, not during the particularly during the daylight hours. There's not a lot of fear because they can, if they can see the shark coming, they can out maneuver it pretty fast. Of course, a, a white shark. One of their favorite hunting methods is to come straight up from deep water. They move again about 25 miles an hour a big shark that's moving vertically in the water column. Uh, it's why when you hear about surfers and people, uh, you know, getting 
knocked off surfboards and stuff by great whites, uh, usually there's an impact. The shark hits them from underneath. It doesn't like sneak up behind them and grab them from behind. They they tend to, to come up. They like to do that vertical attack thing. Uh, but uh, you know they are they are prey items. Uh, during the course of uh, researching one of the chapters of the book, I ran across an article. Uh, it wasn't really an article, it was a research study done by some white shark, re shark researchers who did a study in the Gulf of California and uh, they actually documented uh, you know, the presence of white sharks there and, and kind of what they were eating. And uh, they actually had an account, they documented a 21 foot white shark, this big female white shark that had been killed northwest of Rocky Point in the Gulf there, uh, 21 feet long. I don't know what the weight on it was, but they did an necropsy on it to see what it had been eating. And in, inside they found the remains of two dolphins and two sea lions. Uh, so we know that they're, you know, they're munching on those. I also saw some video, uh, a friend of mine uh, actually runs a sport fishing operation uh, south of Rocky Point there at a little place called Puerto Lobos. And they were out fishing one day, and for fishermen, sea lions really aren't something they like to see around because they like to steal a fish after the fish gets hooked. It's a lot easier to chase if it's hooked to an end of a fishing line. They had a big, big sea lion that showed up, and they were the guy was pretty bummed about it because they were going to have to move to a new location. Well, he took out his handy little cell phone and he was he was videoing, you know, doing video of this sea lion that was right there close to the boat, and all of a sudden. Uh, this great white shark head with these open jaws appeared below the sea lion, just reached up, wrapped around the sea lion, and down it went. Uh, you know, for the fisherman's point, from the fisherman's point of view, he was, they were pretty shocked that it was like, oh, problem solved. Uh, the white shark kind of solved our sea lion problem for us. So, but I was, I've been trying to get that guy to send me that video. It's a pretty amazing video because this, all of a sudden, the shark head just appears with his jaws around the sea lion and whoop, there it goes, so. Well, you have a picture in the book, we'll get to some of the pictures in a little bit, but of, of, a, of a sea lion with its mouth open. And that's a pretty yep. ferocious bite itself. Well, it would be. Fortunately, in that situation where the, I got that picture, that sea lion was just kind of cruising by me and she decided to bark at me and blow bubbles rather than, uh, you know, actually, uh, swing by and take a, a piece of my leg or something but oh, that's um, human. That's human that picture. photo was actually kind of cool because there was a diver in the background and you know I got this picture of the sea lion cruising past me with his mouth open and if the diver had just been a little more this way you know would have looked like that sea lion was moving in to attack that diver and that probably would have gone viral on the internet for a while uh, before people figured out what it was. You know, we talked before, this is really a beautiful book. It's a beautiful coffee but table book. The photography is wonderful. But, and one of the things you mentioned, though, was the, uh, the Marine Mammal Protection Act in 1972. And there have been efforts now made to weaken it, which, of course, will have impact not only on sea lions, but on a lot of other uh, mammals. And I don't know what, what, what do you think? think about it and what might be, be done about it. Well, it kind of upsets me a little bit that they're they're doing some things to weaken it, uh, particularly with sea lions. They've actually, in the Pacific Northwest, Washington, Oregon in particular, uh, the federal government have, has given, uh, you know, some of those states and uh, Indian tribes actually uh, permission to actually kill uh, sea lions because they feel the sea lions are detrimental to uh, the health of the salmon populations in those areas of the Pacific Northwest. The real problem isn't the, the sea lions. The sea lions are pretty smart and they figured out that uh, if they want a really easy meal, the, way, the best way to get a meal is to swim upstream to where uh, the federal government built some of these dams back during the Great Depression years and they built these big massive water projects without really any concern for how the uh, salmon runs were going to happen with these big concrete plugs on rivers. And since then, they've tried to mitigate that by developing things like fish ladders and stuff like that, 
if you look at the research, fish ladders really haven't been effective um, for doing that. But these, these salmon will swim right up and they will, you know, they'll congregate at the base of these dams trying to figure out how to get over them. Or uh, in some cases, uh, the way they get through is to actually uh, try to swim the turbines to get up into the lake and then continue on upstream. And so they've given uh, people permission to actually, you know, kill them. And, uh, I think uh, the number, I think, for one of those locations, they were given permission to do in around 400. That's actually been in the, the news here recently uh, as they started doing it. And they're going, you know, we tried everything else, we tried everything else. And some of the tribes have actually petitioned the federal government saying, you know, these dams have kind of outlived their purposes and they're kind of coming to the end of their, their lifespan as dams, uh, requiring a lot of, of big, big, big money maintenance and maybe it's time for the dams to go away but so far the feds aren't listening so we've got issues like that happening uh, we also have issues where uh, you know, we have areas that are supposed to be protected uh, protections have basically been lifted uh, you know for uh, fishing and stuff like that in different areas and so there's a lot of a lot of stuff going on right now that's kind of undermining some of these so uh, these laws that have been put into place, and they're things that most Americans are very proud of because they've uh, we've, we've done a great job of conservation in this country. And uh, you know, I know opinions out there vary. Uh, ran into a guy here a while back, actually uh, asked him if he'd like to buy my book, and he made the comment to me. He said, "Well, as far as I'm concerned, the only good sea lion is a dead one." I used to be a, a salmon fisher guy up in in Washington. And I, I hate them. <laughs> I wouldn't miss them at all. Well, guess what? If you want a healthy ocean, you need to kind of keep these things around because they are a top tier predator in the Right. Everybody's a critic. Yeah. Okay, can we see some of these pictures now? Sure. Let me get my share screen going here. Okay. Um, it looks like you guys have disabled my screen sharing. Ah. We'll get our, our crack people on that. Sorry about that. Oh, you're okay. Are you ready? Yep. Yeah, we're ready. Let me start this slideshow. There's no music to this. If you want to continue to, to oh. visit and ask questions or whatever, that's cool. Okay. And the slide, no one for about 30 minutes. Okay. So there's our cover. That picture I call, uh, we called that one, Hey Baby, uh, just because of the way she dropped down and looked right into my uh, camera housing. And do you do mostly of photography in, in Sea Cortez from Nevada? Yeah, these sea lines in this picture are actually from the those just 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 disappeared or from the La Paz area. Uh, right. This one, I believe, he was is, is off the Sea of Cortez as well. This is a young one that actually dropped down and is. Uh, they like to imitate scuba divers. They like to blow bubbles underwater, so she got right in my face. So, this is a group off of uh, on a rock near uh, La Jolla Cove in California. I understand some people don't like them too close because they have a uh, <laughs> smell. Sea lion poop smells really, really, really badly. Oh. Um, it's not a, you know, it's not a, they tend to be noisy, they tend to be stinky, uh, but a lot of people really like seeing them. Uh, City of San Francisco ran into issues when they took over one of the the piers at Fisherman Wharf, Fisherman's I, Wharf. I remember back. seeing them up there, yeah. Pier yeah, there, they yeah. took over a pier. I mean, yeah. it was a huge number of them that came in. They, they, they contemplated ways, you know, how can we 
we fix this, how can we make them go away? And they finally decided that the best way to deal with them was to actually make them a tourist attraction. So you can, to this day, you can actually do a search on, on your computer and put in uh, Fisherman's Wharf uh, web, sea lion webcam and it'll bring up, uh, they've actually established, uh, put in webcams and stuff so you can actually see the sea lions laying there and kind of doing their, doing their thing. And they ended up attracting a lot of visitors. Now the numbers of them aren't what they used to be because up there in Northern Cali, they they tend to move uh, when food food sources kind of move around. So uh, a lot of those sea lions actually pulled out and uh, left because uh, I think there was a it was a maybe a northern anchovy run or something like that happening uh -huh. in an area that was close by and basically they just left. But if you go out there today, I, I imagine you probably see uh, sea lions in that wharf area. Yeah. You know, you can tell in these pictures how long their, their front paws are, or flippers. Yeah, they use them just like, they use them just like legs, uh, yeah. and they're, they move pretty fast with them, too. Of course, they're really fast underwater with those. That's what they, those flippers, their front flippers are basically what they propel themselves with. There's no difference between seals and sea lions. Uh, seals use their back flippers with uh -huh. propulsion, uh, sea lions use their front flippers. And what, what makes them come out of the water? I mean, it's like, you know, time for the sun or? Yeah, sea lions like to kind of hang out in the sun. Uh, they have an endothermic uh, temperature regulating system in their bodies. Uh, right, they warm they up. like to play in the sun and kind of warm up. Yeah. Uh, you know, it, their system works really well that way. They can literally stay at, at sea for days, 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 but there's a place to haul out. They'll typically haul out and, and do social kinds of things. They'll just kind of lay around in heaps. If there's if there's a group of them, they'll just kind of lay around in heaps. Uh -huh. Yeah, they are warm-blooded. Um, they are. Yeah. And uh, their system is, is pretty, it's an interesting system. It utilizes uh, blood vessels in their uh, blubber. Their blubber is a little more complex, a little different than the blubber I've been putting on uh, since I've been locked up with the uh, Oh, uh, <laughs> Welcome to the club. Uh, theirs is actually uh, designed so that uh, you know it it helps them regulate the, the temperature of their bodies. Right. Uh, you know, and and uh, it it really works cool. It's a it's a really neat system. I talk about that in the book a little bit. I give a, a kind of a brief overview of it. Yeah. I probably simplified it more than it is, but uh, right. it works really well for it. And that's the other really great thing about the book of the essays that were written accompanying these pictures. But they are curious. Uh, they absolutely, I mean, particularly uh, where I dive with them in the Sea of Cortez, they, they want to kind of figure out what you're doing. Uh, this one in this picture is helping a guy take a picture. Uh, he's got a little camera he's clicking away there. You'll notice this picture actually has a tag on it. Uh, it's actually been uh, rescued uh, probably by either the Pacific Marine Mammal Center out of La Jolla or possibly the Marine Mammal Rescue Center at SeaWorld. You, you do have an essay on, on um, I think it's, you call it NOLA, about trash in the ocean and how um, some of these get caught up, get caught up in, the, in the trash and therefore unable to swim, unable to move. And yeah, the big thing I've seen with, with sea lions is they, they tend picture. to get stuff caught around their necks. Yeah. And uh, monofilament, or like monofilament fishing nets, and there, there are some photos of, of uh, sea lions in the book, uh, encountering sea lions with these monofilament pieces around their necks. That monofilament only stretches so much, and after it stops stretching, as the sea lion grows, the monofilament actually starts cutting into the skin, and you'll see uh, sea lions with this huge, just nasty-looking uh, band of raw flesh around their necks, uh, caused by basically discarded uh, fishing gear. Uh -huh. now, a plus note: uh, there are organizations in the United States that actually go out and try to render assistance when they, they spot sea lions like this. Right. In Mexico, it's a little different. Uh, 
deal, but they have had they have put some efforts in on some of the larger rookeries. They've had people go in and actually try to chase uh, okay. the sea lions down and get this stuff off their necks. But it's tough to do. I mean, you're you try to wrestle a, a sea lion that weighs several hundred pounds. It's not it's not an easy uh, thing to do without getting hurt. Right. You do, uh, by the way, in the book. What, you know, like I said, it is educational and, and conservation. There's a list of um, uh, centers for people who do this kind of work, rescuing uh, sea, mammals, sea life. Um, and if people are looking to make a donation, um, as part of the proceeds of the book, to, to, to go to those. Um, yeah, for everybody that, you know, every time I sell a book, uh, part, of, part of the proceeds actually go to uh, a marine mammal rescue center. There are lots of good ones. Uh, what most people don't know about these marine mammal rescue centers is that uh, they are not government run. They are actually uh, they're run uh, basically by by donations. Uh, the Pacific Marine Mammal Center almost their their almost their entire staff are vol these people are volunteers mm -hmm. uh, from the surrounding communities who come in and they have to. If you want to be trained volunteer at that particular center, you have to be willing to give them about, uh, you know, to give them a commitment of a year where they can schedule you to come and actually work with the animals and help with the recovery efforts. Uh, uh, sea World in San Diego, they've got a pretty extensive uh, program going down there. Uh, but most of these outfits uh, are actually, uh, they're supported by donations, uh, totally. and. You know, these right. sea lion is not uh, a cheap animal to feed if you're trying to get it back to health so you can release it. It costs a lot of money to do that. So, yeah, yeah there's Calif coast of California, they've got it zoned off. They've got different areas. And I included a map in the book to kind of familiarize people with that. Right. You do give a list of um, those organizations. Yeah, they're all good organizations. They're, they're all doing really, really, really good work out there. Uh, we spent, you know, uh, we spent a day out at one of the centers, uh, the one in Laguna Beach, uh, Zip Marine Mammal Center. We, they let us come in and they actually let me into their intensive care unit to do photographs and stuff for the book. And uh, my wife and I were just absolutely astounded at the level of activity and all of the stuff that was going on uh, constantly as they were caring for these uh, these injured animals, animals yeah. and uh, babies that have been abandoned by their, their mothers and, and uh, stuff like this, all with the, the intent of uh, getting them back out into the plane. And speaking of that, one uh, female gives birth to one or two or three pups? Uh, usually just one. And, and it mothers it and takes care of it for how long before it? Well, they basically, um, they rely on their, their mother's milk, uh, you know, for a couple of months. They are mammals, and right. so they do uh, nurse their young. And uh, I think usually after about uh, two and a half, three months, uh, it's time, you know, for the, the young ones to kind of be off on their own, doing their own thing. And uh, what size would they be by then, roughly? What's that? What size after two or three months have, you know, that they're going to have to oh, forage for themselves? You know, they're still, still fairly small, uh, under 100 pounds. Mm -hmm. uh, probably, uh, op, you know, really optimal weight uh, would be 60 to 70 pounds, which is one of the issues that, uh, you know, the, these marine mammal rescue centers are dealing with. They've got a lot of, uh, of orphaned pups that are washing up in Southern California. Uh, these pups kind of their their mothers go out to try to find food to eat off the rookeries there in the Channel Islands, and uh, they're gone for prolonged periods of time because the the food they're chasing isn't readily available. And so, a lot of times these pups are starving, and they literally will get they'll just enter the water. They don't know how to hunt. Uh, they really don't know what they're doing, but. They just kind of make the swim for it, and the currents tend to wash them up in Southern California. There, uh, same thing happens, I think, in Northern California as well. Yeah. But uh, a lot of them come in, and they're extremely, extremely underweight. Uh, you know, for how old they are. You have a pup that 
you know, should weigh uh, 40, 50, 60 pounds. It comes in, and when they rescue it, it weighs like 20. Wow. And it doesn't know how to hunt or know yeah. how to eat. There's, uh, a, there's that shot hmm. of the um, lion with its mouth open and its teeth. <laughs> and that's a growl, huh? Oh, uh, she just went, she cruised by and barked and blew bubbles. And he was really, uh, she was, that was on that particular dive, there were several that were actually uh, heavily, heavily, heavily engaged and uh, played with me. Uh, that dive, they were actually showed up and I was facing one way and I kept getting bumped on the back and they were taking turns, uh, taking runs at my, my back, bumping one of my shoulders as they swam by. And uh, it was kind of an interesting uh, dive, uh, diving with them that day. When I turned around and faced them, they kind of switched games, decided they didn't want to play that game anymore because I could actually watch them come, get out of the way. Well, they, they seem to really enjoy their environment, you know? They, I, you know, if you just, can just sit back and this particular location on this slide is an example, that's in La Paz probably the heaviest visited sea lion rookery in, in the world. Uh, lots and lots and lots of divers go out there and, and uh, watch those guys. And I, I had the opportunity just to sit out there, lay on a rock underneath the water, just watch them play in front of me. And that was really yeah. uh, just fun. I didn't interact with me, they were just playing what I call sea lion games with, the, with other sea lions. Hard work, huh? But somebody's got to do it. <laughs> <laughs> is there a distinction feature between a male and a female well size is usually the the key Fe thing that kind of clues you in as to what what's what uh the sea lion the, a male does have a different shaped head it has more of a it's kind of a bump on its forehead its forehead the top of his head actually extends higher up off of its skull than uh, a female does. Females are a little more streamlined. Uh, you know, for example, both of these here are females. They're not males. They've got kind of that smooth from the nose between their eyes to the back of uh -huh. their uh, their head. On a male. Oh um, yeah, th th these two in this picture, you can, it looks like one is a male and one is a female. No, uh, they're both females. They're both. This one is this one's a female. Uh, you can kind of tell by that that lack of uh, a height of their oh, right. of head. their head from yeah. their nose so you'll you know uh, they're pretty pronounced to bump mm -hmm. the, those guys but for example this guy here is a male you look look at this uh bump that's that's uh yeah i see right that. there yeah. kind of yeah. between his eyes mm -hmm. that's a good sized male that guy's probably about 700 pounds and he's laying on the beach in la jolla cove Beautiful. Yeah, freezing the motion on them underwater is sometimes kind of hard because they they tend to they can really 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 come by fast. It's kind of like watching a jet fly by sometimes. Mm -hmm. uh, but do you find if you dove in that you would start to attract them? I mean, that they would come just to see who's who's in the area? Uh, yeah. They'll come by to check you out. They're they're not shy about coming over to check you out. They may not, uh, you know, they may choose to go someplace else, but they'll typically, if they see you, they'll come over and they'll they'll kind of check on you and, and see what what you're up to. Um, at one location a couple of years ago, that uh, the there was a group of females with young, and they were kind of being a little bit uh, contrary. They they weren't letting anybody really approach or they weren't really approaching the groups. They were just kind of hanging out. But we found out, of course, later that one of the reasons they were probably a little bit shy is there had been a bunch of illegal uh, poaching activities going on in that area. So right. they were a bit uh, shy of anybody being around them. There is, there is an overall general decline in, in seafood populations in most of the oceans. Some of it probably overfishing, but some of it just because the environment has changed. Well, the environment is changing, uh, and 
and a lot of, uh, particularly there off the coast of California, the Pacific Ocean is typically very, very cold, but uh, the, the temperature only has to go up a few degrees for some of the fish to actually try to find a better place to live. Mm -hmm. So a lot of these fish are actually leaving and going someplace else. So which impacts and major yeah. impacts, of course, off Southern Cali there with, yeah. um, you know, fisheries right. type and sardines and anchovy fishermen. Uh, I'm trying to remember, uh, I, I think there's been such a shortage of fish out there for years to years due to warm water that uh, those guys haven't been there as much of a take there. Now, this shark, you were, in, you were in, hopefully in a cage when you took this one. Well, I was supposed to be, but no, I wasn't. Uh, I uh, with underwater photography. One of the things that that is really, really critical. If you're going to get good images. You have to be as close as you can be to your subject. Uh, this particular one here was really, really close. I was actually hanging off the side, the outside of the shark cage. Uh, had one leg inside the viewing window, so I could kind of pull myself back out of harm's way, which. I did when this guy actually came after me. That was a big male. Wow. Came so how, how big do you think that one get out of the cage if I can. How big do you think that one was? That was 16 feet. Uh, his name is The Legend. Uh, he's a regular out at uh, Guadalupe Island off the coast of Baja. Uh -huh. They're about a 28-hour boat ride from San yeah. Diego. Hmm. And, uh, I've seen him. I've been out there a couple of times, and I've seen him both trips. The second trip, he wasn't nearly as jazzed up. He didn't try to eat me like he did the first one, but I'm sure I looked just like a sea lion hanging off that cage. And he probably had a rough day. He probably had some sea lions chasing him, biting him, and stuff like that. So he decided to try to get some food. There's one with a neck injury with a piece of fishing line. That yeah, I can see that. Right. Yeah, wrapped around his neck. But you can see the wound that's. Uh, that's there. I'm sure the sea lion probably died as a result of that at some point. Yeah. Well, the pictures are just beautiful. They really are. And a typical dive for you is what? An hour? Uh, depends on how much work I'm having to do underwater. Uh, I can usually get at least an hour off the tank, uh, sometimes an hour and a half, depending uh -huh. on. Uh, you know how much I have to move around. Uh, I've had dives that have last take my longest dive on just a regular 80 cubic foot uh, dive tank. I think I got an hour and 45 minutes off one. Uh, one time actually came up because the the guys on the boat were wet, were tired of waiting for me to get back on. So but this camera rig I push around. It's a pretty good sized uh, piece of equipment and. When I have to swim around with it, it uh, takes a little bit of energy. You kind of get to breathe a little bit hard when you're. Yeah, you actually do in the book also explain the equipment that you use. And um, yeah. it really is, the, the book is just fantastic. It really is educational um, and wonderful stories. And so if uh, people are looking for a great gift and a great book, um, not only because the pictures are beautiful, but the, but the message is also from both an educational standpoint and a conservation standpoint. In fact, you, you, I don't know if you, could, if you want to read some of the things you say people can do to help preserve our, our natural environment and, and also the environment for these you know, incredible creatures. Well, there's a lot of things that people can do and some pretty easy things to do. Uh, first of all, and you know, I, I try not to be really super, super political, but when it, term, when it comes to conservation stuff, uh, the political side of it kind of comes out. I think that if you're interested in conserving the ocean, you need to use the power of your boat. You need to find out how the people who are running for office feel about conservation, and not just how they feel, but what they're actually willing to do. And you know, if those people get elected, that you're uh, that are that are talking a good story, uh, hold them accountable for that the kinds of things that they said that they would do. Uh, model responsible behavior, this picture right here, there's a lot of irresponsible behavior going on there. Uh, the people were too close to the sea lions. Uh, you know, they're protected, they're protected species, but people tend to either not know about that or forget about it. So you model responsible behavior. Uh, you know, I'm fortunate for all of these land pictures of sea lions. Uh, 
they're all done with, most of those are done with a telephoto lens. It's not like I'm getting right up in this big guy's face. Probably a good thing because he probably weighed 800 pounds and he wouldn't probably appreciate me, uh, you know, walking up there and sticking my camera on his nose. So, you know, uh, so you do responsibly behavior kinds of things. So uh, you want to use, uh, you know, what you buy as your voice. Uh, you know, there are companies out there that are trying to be environmentally responsible, not just with resources, but with resources in general. Uh, there's very good companies that actually, uh, you know, uh, yeah, their stuff can, can kind of be expensive, uh, but they're producing, uh, trying to produce things with as little impact on the environment as possible. And if you're interested in some of those companies, uh, all you have to really do is just a little research online. Uh, you know, I, I, I often use the company Patagonia as an example. Uh, these guys are, are very much into environmental, not just environmentally protecting things, but they're also into trying to do what they call fair trade. In other words, paying people who work for them a fair rate wage for actually producing the clothing that they do. Uh, you know, look at some of these, these companies that you're thinking about doing business with. Uh, what kinds of things are they talking about? What kinds of behaviors are they actually doing? Uh, you know, the seafood uh, industry, you know, has a, a big history of uh, mislabeling products. Uh, you know, that's it's one of those things. I used to hassle, for example, the guy at the seafood counter at our, our local grocery store that we frequent here. I'd always hassle the guy because, you know, every time I'd go in there, they'd have these make-believe scallops that were yeah. at a yeah, scallop counter. And uh, you know they're not they're not scallops. They're actually uh, chunks of, of meat that are made from some type of ray or skate type fish. And uh, I realized I was I was asking the wrong guy one day. I was in there and I wrestled this about ten times. And he finally looked at me and he said, you know, he said, I just work here, man. You know, I, I I don't even I've never even been to the ocean. You know, I just I'm guy here who, you know, they corporate sends me this stuff with the package label and I just put it out. Yeah. I, you know, I realized, well, I'm probably hassled the wrong person. I probably ought to be, be uh, trying to, to send stuff to this corporate headquarters instead of hassling him about this. And so I did. Uh, the, the fake stuff still continues to show up, but I, you know, what the heck, I keep trying. Uh, educating uh, yourself about issues that involve the ocean environment. Uh, even things as simple as picking up trash when you go to the beach. Uh, you know, pick up, you know, yeah, it's not your stuff, but, you know, uh, spend a little time uh, picking stuff up. Odds are probably pretty good if you're modeling responsible behavior by doing that. Somebody else is gonna come along and say, you know, I need to pick up some trash too. And we can keep this garbage out, out of the ocean and, and keep it from hurting things. And, Stuff like that. So there's a lot of a lot of different things, and really the you know I gave a kind of a good overview I think in the book of some of those things. But there's a lot of information about out there available if people are interested in really being environmentally conscious and responsible. And I think the responsibility thing. I think it's a privilege. I think we have the privilege of you know being responsible uh, for trying to take care of this planet that we live on. Yeah. Well, I think you mentioned it before that man is one of their biggest predators in the sense of what we you know we do with the ocean uh and the other thing just one other thing you mentioned you didn't mention but it, it is in the book about single use of plastic uh, materials and yeah, that's a, a really good one uh, that's a real bugaboo uh, a lot of people and uh, you don't have to look very hard regardless of where you are in the ocean you don't have to look very, very far to find uh, single-use plastics that are out there. Uh, you know, uh, things like trash bags uh, or their grocery bags floating around out there. Right. Uh, you know, there's a picture in the book of a trash bag that we encountered. It's, it's obvious it came from a Target store. The nearest Target store was over 400 miles away. We were 400 miles south of the border in Baja. Yeah. And I found that, that bag just floating along the and sea lions probably would mess with it, other than maybe to play with it. But something like a sea turtle comes along and looks at it and says, "Oh, 
jellyfish. I'll try to eat that, and then yeah. you end up right. with a dead turtle. Right. So. Well, again, it's, it is a beautiful book. Um, pictures are fantastic. That's a good sampling that you showed, and um, and the essays were, were terrific. It's not just a coffee table book. And, um, well, the ocean is an incredibly beautiful place, and I am often asked people want to know, well, what's what's next? Uh, you know, if you manage to uh, you know make some money off selling uh, the sea lion book, are you going to do another book? And uh, you know, I've actually toyed with the idea of, of doing a book about uh, dolphins and whales. Uh, you know, I think it'd probably be pretty easy to get a book uh, to sell if I did a book about sharks. But uh, dolphins and whales, there's a, I have a real strong uh, attachment with uh, these kinds of critters. And I think it would really be cool to do a, a book about them. So the tail end of the slideshow, uh, these are just a few, uh, I guess for lack of a better term, teaser images to say, you know, there's a lot of beauty out there in the ocean. And, and for a lot of it, you don't have to actually be under the water to see it. Uh, oh, you can actually see this incredibly dynamic environment with a lot of that. Yeah, one of my great experiences is uh, we went fishing off of Cabo one time. And just on the boat ride out, I didn't know there really are flying fish. <laughs> <laughs> and also laying in the front of the bow, I could pet the dolphins as they kept up with the boat. It was just incredible. And they were just having so much fun just swimming right next to the boat. So yeah. I, I, flying fish are right there, right off the coast of California. You know, you have to, you know, they're a fairly common uh, species. Uh, you know, off the coast of Southern Cali, out there. It's right. a, you know, and they are, uh, you know, they're they're kind of a cool species to uh, to see. Yeah, what is this co coming out of the water here? That's the back of a humpback whale. Oh, oh, that's right, right, right. They wow. shot that off the back, uh, the swim step on the boat. I uh, was leaning out. My wife had a hold of my belt to try to keep me from falling down. <laughs> Anyway, it was too loud. Wow, that's a great shot too. Well, again, um, thank you very much for your time. That it, it's just a beautiful book, and um, from the very first time that I saw it, I was I was captured by it. So, and I think well, people will too. It was a lot of fun to put it together, and uh, it took a while to do it, but uh, hopefully, uh, as people watch this presentation, they'll be interested in uh, taking a look at it closer. I'm sure they will. I'm sure they will. And um, mahalo to you too. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. It's a pleasure, really. A great book. And it, Thank you. I enjoyed it. Okay. Thanks. Are we done?